So we're going to get into looking at some background to Ephesus. And so to do that, let's open in prayer. <laughs> Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for all the great information we've been given to to help us understand the uh, society that those words were first written to, those believers that we share a common Lord with, even though we were separated by millennia. Uh, just ask that you'll guide us as we look through this and help us to understand a little better what's going on in Ephesus and the challenges that we're facing the believers there in the first century. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the city of Ephesus. I'm going to start there. I'm going to kind of do that part. I'm going to talk a little bit about the culture. Then Al's going to talk about all the, basically all the references in the New Testament to Ephesus, right? I hope I'll the time runs out. Okay. <laughs> I'll try not to let that happen. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the city of Ephesus, the, the first century uh, geographer, historian, Strabo, uh, I'm sure you've all read him, right? That's, uh, anyway, uh, wrote that the area that we know as Ephesus today was originally settled by the Amazons. How about that? Uh, that that uh, legendary warrior society of all females, uh, so, and that was, they ran the, ran, they actually named the city of Ephesus and the city of Smyrna. Uh, they were the occupants, and around 1100 B.C., according to Strabo, they were driven out by the Ionian Greeks. So, um, that's where we begin to get the Greek influence then in that part of uh, what, what is today uh, western Turkey. The... Uh, Ionian Greeks uh, established kind of a, a, a center there, uh, an actual capital. Uh, they were one of the four major tribes of Greeks during that time. And they occupied an area that already had people there, uh, native Carians and Lydians, some other tribes like that, who were settled around this, this temple to the, an Anatolian fertility goddess. Okay. Anatolia is the area we know today as Turkey. And so the Greeks came in. They said, well, okay, this is pretty close to one of the members of our religious pantheon, which is Artemis. So we're going to make this a temple of Artemis, and we're going to establish this city here. And this, because of two things, really, Ephesus just thrived over the next few centuries. One of them was... It had a great harbor. It was right in the middle of the western coast of Asia Minor, so a perfect place to take off into the Aegean for all kinds of directions to the west. Um, it was also the center of the, of the worship of Art Artemis. It became a very popular thing, uh, a place of pilgrimage for people in these early centuries. So those two things contributed to, to Ephesus becoming a pretty important city. Uh, very early on, so we're talking, you know, the, into the, you know, the 11th through the 7th century B.C. Now, by the 6th century B.C., Ephesus became the western extent of the Persian Empire. So, if you know anything about the Persian Empire, one of the famous things that they built, particularly one particular ruler, uh, Cambyses II, in the 6th century, finished up what was called the Royal Highway or the Royal Road. That's this line you see going across here all the way from Susa down in the corner to, to Sardis, Ephesus area up here on the western side. And that was the famous 1,700-mile uh, road that could be traversed by Persian uh, couriers in a week. Usually it would take a month to travel that distance in those days. So um, this was, became a pretty important part for the, uh, uh, later on in the Persian Empire, they be, went to war with the Greeks, and so they would have been traveling that road to get to the coast to cross over into, uh, to attack the Greeks in their own mainland. So there's lots of activity, lots of trade that went on this thing very early on. In the 4th century BC, the uh, area was taken over by Alexander the Great. So it became under Greek or Macedonian influence. And 
in 133 BC, Ephesus came under the control of Rome. So that kind of brings us to much closer to the time period we're talking about. Ephesus was made the capital of the uh, senatorial province of Asia. Now, if you remember last time we, I was here, this is a test. No, <laughs> it won't be a test. That the, the Romans had two types of provinces. One was senatorial and one was imperial. The senatorial provinces were the ones that they didn't have any trouble with. They were the ones that were centers of trade and commerce and important to the economy and the whole support of the empire. The imperial provinces were the ones that were the trouble, like Judea was an imperial province. But Asia was a, which is just part of what we call Asia Minor, just on the western end, Ephesus became the capital of that for the Romans under Augustus. The this again added to the substantial growth and importance of this city. Uh, it experienced, uh, uh, you know, commercial growth because of the harbor and the roads. You can see the Roman roads that go right up through Ephesus, and that would be a jumping-off point for transfer of uh, commerce, you know, products from the east. The it made them pretty wealthy in that area. By the New Testament times. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Uh, the population estimates are somewhere between 200 and 250,000 at this time. Uh, considered the first and the greatest metropolis in Asia, in Asia Minor. Only Rome and Athens were ranked above it in terms of importance. So I think it's important. We, you know, we think of Ephesus as just another city, another New Testament city. But it was, it was significant, it was important, it had been important for, for literally millennia by this time and continued to be during the first century. Um, you can, there's evidence of how important it is because if, you, if the, the, fine, the you know, ruins around the Roman roads in Asia Minor, they have these stone milestones and they have carved into them the distances between cities. And almost all the distances are Ephesus to or Ephesus from. So, you know, that made it pretty much the center of things that was going on right there. Now, Ephesus had a lot of uh, things within the structures of the city. It had a uh, typical Greco-Roman city. It had baths, you know, public baths, these big, and they had a gymnasium, which was important to the Greek kind of culture. They had a stadium where they had gladiatorial contests. They had multiple agoras. Agoras are marketplaces uh, that they had throughout the city. But the most prominent features, two features of the city, were the Temple of Artemis and the theater. So we're going to talk a little bit about those just to kind of give a sense for what was going on. The Temple of Artemis had been there for a long time. I just talked about it clear back in 1100 uh, BC. It was, there was something going on there. And the uh, temple was destroyed by fire in uh, 356 and was rebuilt. And it was continually added onto and renovated and added onto and renovated for the next few centuries. So by the time you get to the first century, it's the largest known structure in the ancient world. It's bigger than a football field. This little square there above it, that rectangle is a football field size. And you can see how much space that temple occupied. Uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. We won't have a test naming the rest of them or anything like that. But uh, the temple was to Artemis, but we've got to make some distinctions here that are important. Uh, while the original Anatolian mother goddess that was there, that uh, fertility goddess that was there originally, you know, the, the Greeks brought in the name Artemis and kind of attached it to that. But by the time we get to this period in history that we're in right now, the uh, Artemis of the Ephesians was slightly different from Artemis of the Greek pantheon. The Artemis of the Greek pantheon was a, a virgin hunter, uh, uh, was a deity associated with nature and associated with animals and with fertility. Uh, one of the 12 Olympians, you know, if you get into Greek mythology. But the Artemis of the Ephesians, based on the best literature that uh, you can find at the time, Evidence shows that the, that really didn't have anything to do with fertility or mothering. 
that this Artemis, the suggestions are that there was one thing that was important was a, was a patron saint of midwifery, but also of virginity, which sort of left out the fertility part of it, pretty, pretty big. Uh, it was also a representative, it went back to, harken back to that distant past of the Amazons uh, in terms of representation, and was a goddess that was much associated with salvation and uh, protection in terms of the things that were offered or expected from this, you know, favors from this god or goddess. Um, of course, Artemis wasn't the only deity worshipped in Ephesus or any other ancient city at the, of any substance at this time. Uh, the close competitor was Dionysus. Now, Dionysus is a god of wine and merrymaking, okay? So revelry and, and all this kind of stuff. So that's where you get maybe this kind of association with those sorts of activities in, in Ephesus. Uh, uh, Dionysus is also the god of in, insanity, which I thought was so much kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, drink yourself crazy, I guess, was the only... And then the name is Bacchus. That also is the god Bacchus, the same, the same ones. Uh, the Roman historian Plutarch uh, recorded that when Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, you know, uh, entered Ephesus in 41 BC, they were uh, uh, Anthony was was hailed as uh, Dionysus, a giver of joy and beneficence. Anyway, so you know, here you are, the center of the Temple of Artemis, but they're you know, identifying him with Dionysus. So that was another important call, an important uh, influence in Ephesus. Uh, in AD 26, there were 11 cities that were vying for the site of the imperial temple under Tiberius. Okay, now this is, we've got, with Augustus and Tiberius, you begin to have this imperial cult developing. And uh, this is Tiberius who is in charge now. And the Roman Senate in Tiberius passed over Ephesus because of the influence of, of the Temple of Artemis. They went elsewhere with the imperial uh, temple, imperial cult. Now that's important because that means that in there was probably that wasn't didn't mean that wasn't part of Ephesus, but they did not have an imperial temple in Ephesus. They didn't have one until under Domitian, which isn't until the late 90s uh, A.D. So at the time the New Testament was written, the imperial cult was not important. But the imperial cult became important, for example, by the time we get to Revelation. <clears throat> so that's where kind of some of that comes together. Uh, maybe I'll touch on that, I'm not sure. But uh, <clears throat> evidence reveals the citizens at Ephesus, though worshipped probably over 50 gods and goddesses. There were hundreds of, uh, literally hundreds, of natural features, groves, waterfalls, springs uh, that had shrines and grottos associated with various spirits and, uh, and, and mystical properties of various kinds. And another pretty important part of Ephesus was it was known and was a center of magic and sorcery. Now that's important because in this time period, Ephesian writings was the phrase used to describe any document that had incantations or spells written on it. So to show you how important it was. Now, now we're going to find out that's the case in Ephesus as the church began to develop there as well. So that, you know, that's kind of the, the religious world and, of, of Ephesus at this time. The theater represents sort of the, if you kind of look at that religious, broadly based sort of uh, side of things and maybe include some of the gladiatorial contests and other things that were you know, contests that were going on in that, the theater in Ephesus represented the high culture of the city. Uh, this, this, the theater in Ephesus uh, was located right at the heart of the city. It, the amphitheater set into the side of a mountain. Uh, it was right at the intersection of the two major roads that crossed through that city. Um, it had been there for 300 years by the time we're looking at the New Testament as a host to the Greek tra tragedies and dramas of Greek, you know, that were Greek drama. That were so part, much an important part of that. And drama is very important in the first century, much more than in our, in our world. Um, became the center of Greek drama. It's, it's the structure of the, of the theater itself. And you can kind of, this is a, 
Al's got another slide that's got a neat kind of representation of this. The little comparison down here at the bottom, you can't see very well, this is the, is the theater and Wrigley Field. It would hold 25,000 people uh, in this thing. It had uh, this, this, the stage was structured, the bottom layer, the bottom circle at the bottom here, you know, between the, the amphitheater and the stage, there was a moat and a big flat semicircle area called the orchestra. And uh, the orchestra was, had above it, by about nine feet, a stone stage. So the, the stage was set above it. The chorus would stay down in the orchestra area. The chorus is very important to Greek drama. And then you, the action was on the stage up above. And behind the stage, separated by the stone pillars, were seven windows or openings. And what's this? For pointing. For pointing. Oh. Oh. Wow. I, I don't, anyway, it's not working. There we go. Okay, so there and there and okay. Now that I'm old, this is the last thing that I have on my point to. But <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, the and these seven uh, openings were called thermata, and most stages in the in the Greek world, the drama, the, these theaters only had three to five. Seven was unique. It allowed a great deal of uh, innovation to take place. They could have more scenes per act or more acts, you know, maybe behind each of these scenes that these, these windows represented. Um, the chorus, which is, of course, the most important part, sat, you know, semicircle facing the amphitheater and the orchestra. And between the two, in the center of this thing, I can't point one more place here, right in about there was the throne and temple to Dionysus thrown and altered to Dionysus. That was always there. And so they would offer, usually Dionysus had morphed now into the goddess of drama as well as merrymaking and all these other things in Ephesus. Uh, so Ephesus at this point was a center of cultural and commercial life. Uh, it, in that sense, it became a microcosm, and I think a great microcosm of the Greco-Roman world because it had all these different influences going on in it. And so the second thing I want to talk about or look at here in terms of the culture of Ephesus was, is particularly the idea, what did it mean to be a Christian in first century Ephesus? What did that involve? A um, couple things that are important we need to look at, even though we're jumping a little bit ahead in time from where we are in the New Testament. Uh, by the reign of Nero, which was 54 to 68 A.D., uh, Christians were a readily identifiable group. Now that's significant. You know, you got all these different groups, these different peoples, but Christians were readily identifiable. <clears throat> the Roman historian uh, Tacitus describes Nero's persecution of the Christians in Rome, and it just took place in Rome. It was just localized. But it talked about him. He describes them as being hated for their abominations, promoting deadly and dangerous superstition. They were accused and convicted of hatred of the human race as they were executed. Uh, the term used by Tacitus and others, uh, this idea of superstition carried with it beliefs and rituals that were deemed excessive, repellent, even monstrous to the society around them. Christians and their religion was different. It was objectionably so to people at this time. It was not simply just another type of Roman, Greco-Roman religion out there or faith or belief out there. It was unique in its objectionable nature to, the, to everybody. Now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because of these great descriptions. This is describing what's going to be going on not only at this time but going forward in Christian history. By the time you get to the second century, the outspoken critic Celsus occasionally commended Christians for their ethics but, but went on to describe them as people who were, who were generally portrayed as having an inadequate philosophy, uh, who were intellectually inferior, simpletons. Their teachers were all charlatans. Um, they, they welcomed the worst kinds of people into their fellowship. Go figure. 
Uh, they, they destroyed families by promoting tensions between children and their parents. Uh, he alleged that they were antisocial and comprised a threat to the political and cultural structure of the world. For the pagan critics like Celsus, during this time and later, uh, other new religious movements of the time were mildly contemptible, but Christianity was uniquely so. It was extremely contemptible to them. So even if some of the outsiders misunderstood or uh, distorted things about Christianity, they generally agreed that Christians were different, odd, and objectionable. So let's keep those three words in mind. Different, odd, and objectionable. So if you find yourself going through life different, odd, and objectionable, you're in great company, right? Anyway, that's what we're supposed to be. So at what points were the early Christians so different and odd and objectionable? Uh, well, to answer this, we have to understand a little bit about what religion meant. Okay? Now, if, if we were to sit around here and take the time to, as, a, as even a discussion, to define religion as we think of it, I suggest that it's going to cover at least these four areas. It's an association that's been chosen by us, by anybody. Now, sometimes you're born into those things, but still, you know, at some point you choose. Uh, it's a specific set of beliefs concerning deity and usually morality of some kind uh, or ethics. It's a set, there's a set of observed rituals. There are no liturgies associated with this, with this group. And religion is a distinct area or sphere of life. In other words, it's different from our job world or our job sphere. It's different from... Uh, our participation maybe in civic organizations. It's, it's different uh, from maybe the, the holidays or things we celebrate as a society. Uh, it's different from where we get groceries. Okay, I mean, I mean it's, di it's a different sphere of life. That's how we think of it in Western terms. Now, the challenge or the problem with this is that that definition comes from 2,000 years of Christianity. It has no, no connection, really, with the first century idea of religion, or very little connection. For the first century, in both Greek and Latin, they didn't even have a word that connoted these things, or embraced these things, these principles. Now, what they had was, in Greek, they had the word Eusebia. Okay, that's the, the one that is most commonly used in the New Testament. And in Latin, they had the word religio. Don't jump ahead on that one because of what looks familiar. But what these words meant when you put them together, and they overlapped a lot and they were used interchangeably throughout the first century, is the idea of reverence, piety, devotion, showing profound respect for anything, uh, expressing allegiance to or regard for someone or something, fulfilling social obligations and duties. Godliness could be a term that is, that's described here, but that godliness could just mean godliness in the sense that you care about a particular god or, or deity. A strict scrupulousness of some kind, conscientiousness. The point is, is that they didn't even always have, weren't always used exclusively in religious contexts. They could mean, you know, anything that covers any of these areas in social relationships or social settings. Um, they didn't have a, a, a particular reference to beliefs or practices that had to be included. They, they were, the idea of, you know, to come with the, our, our uh, idea, our, word religion comes from the Latin religio, but it did not mean or take on the meaning of a system of religious belief until the Middle Ages. So prior to that, what it meant was reverence or piety. And this reverence or piety in the first century permeated all aspects of life. There was not a separate sphere for it. There was no religious life that you could separate somehow from your work life or any other life, the part of life that you have. Piety was everywhere. So I'm gonna, I wanna give you a few scenarios, okay? If, think about, you know, imagine being a Christian in this kind of a world in first century Ephesus. So you're a member 
of an association of tradesmen, all right? Which means you're upper, what we would call upper middle class or middle class someplace in there. Uh, you were, uh, you're attending a meeting to discuss uh, the supply of raw materials for your products with fellow, fellow tradesmen, okay? The meeting would very likely start with an acknowledgement, an offering, or a toast of some kind to the patron god or goddess of that trade. That's how it started. That's how your meeting began. That's how it's called to order, to put it in our kind of terms. Okay, another scenario. You're a slave in a large household. There's an extended family that lives there, and they all participate regularly in making votive offerings to the family Larry's or spirits. And you're expected to participate in these things because to, do, to fail to do so would be to be a disrespect for your master. You know, your lack of loyalty to the head of the family. It's not a good place for a slave to be. So, okay, another scenario. All right, say you scored tickets for a presentation of Sophocles' Antigone. <laughs> or maybe uh, Oedipus remade by, by Seneca at, the, at this time period. In the center of this fabulous theater, the cultural dramatic center of the whole Greco-Roman world is an altar and throne to Dionysus. That's the focus of attention. And probably offerings made as the beginning of the, you know, the whole thing starts. Your business is good. Okay, here's another one. You have an opportunity to expand it, but it requires a loan. Your primary source would be to borrow it from the treasury of one of the more popular, wealthier temples. They didn't have banks in the sense that we do, that you went to. And of course, once you secured that loan, in order to secure that loan, you've got to pay appropriate homage to the god or goddess of that temple. Otherwise, you just don't have to do without the loan then, otherwise. Of course, we got a great New Testament example I know Al's going to be talking about. Uh, perceived threat to piety and associated economic well-being of the silversmiths in Ephesus, where they spent two hours shouting, Artemis of the Ephesians, and great as Artemis, in opposition to Paul and what he was teaching. Given this ubiquitous linkage in all these different areas of life, you can imagine what it was like for a Christian in this world to navigate or negotiate their life, their daily affairs. Now, we have in the New Testament, you know, meat offered to idols. That's another. The grocery store is there, too. I mean, you, all these things are things that they had to deal with that we don't because there was no separate sphere of religious life in the first century. It was all integrated together. Now, the attitudes toward the diversity of gods and their worship was completely tolerant in this culture or society. People routinely linked various gods uh, from other places with those they were familiar with, uh, and they embraced the various practices that associated with that. Uh, there was no concern that one deity would be offended by uh, worshiping another deity. There wasn't any issue there. And, and this is actually a, a quote that I think covers this well. All deities were deemed worthy of reverence. For people in this era, uh, piety meant a readiness to show appropriate reverence for the gods, any and all gods. Outright refusal to worship deities was deemed bizarre, antisocial, and worse still, impious and irreligious. Kind of give you an idea where some of this is going to go. So we should begin to understand what it was that made Christians so different, odd, and objectionable. I'm going to talk about five of them. Tonight. There's others, but five points because we're going to see them in Ephesians, we're going to see them in Philippians, and we're going to see them in Colossians. These are the, thing, you know, the things that were expected of the church. So, Christian difference. Five of these things I want to talk about. One God, exclusive allegiance. That's one of the key ideas. One trans 
ethnic and transnational community. That was unusual and heard of in this world of tribal kind of orientations and family orientations. A requirement of moral behavior. A new social order, or a modified social order, to what was already there. And finally, opposition to superstition and magic. So we're going to look at each one of these. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, and we'll look at some, uh, not in, in real detail, but at least some passages in Ephesians that you can relate these things to as we get to them in our study. So the first one here, you know, one God with exclusive allegiance. That one's pretty easy to figure out what we've talked about so far. Uh, the Jews, of course, believed in one God, but the Jews were allowed a pass because it was considered an ethnic distinctive. Okay? It's just part, eh, these are just Jews. This is what they do. This is what they think. And there were other groups that maybe you could kind of put in that category. But that's one of the reasons why they were never quite fully members of the first century society. It's why, why you know, Augustus got mad at them and threw them all out of Rome at one time. Uh, so in the, in the first century. There, there were that, this is why they never really were quite in those positions. They were always kind of in closed with themselves, little ghettos and enclaves of these people throughout the uh, Mediterranean world. For Christians, there's one body, one spirit, just so you are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. All of the gods and pieties were considered idolatry by Christians. And to make it worse, Christians engaged in sharing these exclusive beliefs with others, with the idea that they would join them in those beliefs. And that was particularly offensive in the culture. In fact, the radical selectivity, exclusivity of the early church Christian worship was neither acceptable nor even readily comprehensible by the Greco-Roman world. The second one is kind of related to this, this idea of trans-ethnic, transnational community. A lot of the gods and the, the various temples and worship areas and things that were set up in the first century in Ephesus and other places had to do with uh, gods they carried with them when they came to these areas. Uh, there was lots of traffic from different parts of the empire through Ephesus, and so you had some representation of all kinds of things all through there. And, and so there was a, this ex expectation that, okay, if you had a particular ethnic association or a national association, you're probably going to be more inclined toward this particular God, like the Jews, for example. But the Christians, now the Christians, they came along and said, no, that has nothing to do with this. It has nothing to do with God. As we saw in Galatians, you know, there is, we just finished, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, that sort of pushed him out of the past the Jews got because of their ethnicity, because this is no longer one ethnic group. This is from people from all over the place. The Jewish ethnic toleration was not available. Paul makes a point, not only is this a truth of Christianity, but he makes a point that it's a central mystery that was revealed to him. He talks about this bringing together of Jews and Gentiles, and he says then that the mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the body and partakers of the promise of Jesus Christ through the gospel that was the mystery revealed to him that he was so excited to share with people. But that makes this a trans-ethnic, transnational group. Okay, requirement of moral behavior. I'm going to keep moving here because I'm running out of time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> apart from primary, a few philosophic schools of the time, uh, there was not very much emphasis on ethics or morality in this culture. 
uh, a few elites sought to live virtuously, and, but they still practiced reverence for all the gods. Um, that wasn't something they gave up. They were motivated more by an individual sense of honor, by allegiance to some philosophic position, and by an avoidance of shame more than anything else. But Christian morality was not considered optional. Ethical behavior was not an option for the Christian. It was an expectation. It was a commandment in most cases. And so we have this. This is a big passage, and I won't, we won't you know, obviously cover it all, but I just mainly wanted to put them out there for you so you can look at them later. But within this passage, we have kind of molded together what were considered virtue and vice lists. That was the way ethics was communicated in the first century. You had lists of virtues, lists of vices. You find these all throughout the New Testament. And you have these, uh, like if looking at some of the, the vice side of it, let the thief no longer steal. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Uh, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Um, sexual morality and impurity of co- or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place. Uh, everyone who is sexually immoral and impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Pretty strong language, particularly for the first century with their lax moral standards, when you had everything from this more disciplined, maybe worship of Artemis of the Ephesians, to Dionysus, and wild reverie, and orgies, and all kinds of things. Uh, We see this again, a little bit, uh, another example of this in in, in chapter 5. And I think this is an important one because, particularly thinking of Dionysus and what went on with those celebrations, do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Paul may have had that in mind when he wrote this command to the believers in Ephesus. Okay, we have a new social order. Uh, last time I talked about the Greco-Roman social order was well established. Starting at the bottom, you had slaves, and then you had freemen. I mean, slaves, liberated slaves, freedmen, uh, you know, kind of working up through the various levels of society. Uh, The the foundation involves a family that was led by the uh, uh, paterfamilias, the father, head of the house, with his absolute authority over spouse, over children, over extended family, and slaves. Wives were expected to obey their husbands, manage their household well, be faithful, worship their husbands' gods. Uh, there was a new, kind of a new model coming out of, at, during this time of a, a new woman emerging in the first century. I think I mentioned that one last time. Uh, that allowed women to be more socially self-determined and involved in financial affairs and politics and things like that. Uh, but it was just beginning to happen, beginning to come. The New Testament commands find some kind of a path between those two. And uh, kind of uh, address both of them in passages like Ephesians 5. Wives submit to your own husbands. That's a same thing you would have heard in a Potter familius environment, but you wouldn't have had as to the Lord on the end of it. Uh, in verse 25, husbands loved your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself. Now there was a concept that went against the cultural stream in how the family was run. Uh, Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she respects her husband. You can see that kind of middle ground there. We're not letting, we're not complete women's lib here, but uh, we're a lot better off than they were in most situations. And you have this mutual exhortation to identify with Christ and how you go about these things. Um, they were the same, uh, husbands particularly were expected to, expect to, to, to exhibit the same standards of holiness and honor that women were, their wives were, uh, in the broader culture, which was a direct challenge to the double standard of male sexual behavior at the time. In verses 31 and 32 particularly I think are important because they set a context of appropriate sexual relationships in stark contrast to those prohibited behavior that we've already seen 
uh, in, in Ephesians 5 where it talked about but sexual morality and impurity don't even let it be named among you. And so this idea of tying together in these, those two verses, the uh, Jesus Christ and his, a pat, and his church is a pattern for marriage and where these things are supposed to go on. Ephesians 6 goes on and talks about relationships between parents and children where they address drawing on Old Testament principles and in, later after that, relationships between masters and slaves were addressed by reorienting their relationships around equal standing in Christ and accountability to Christ for both masters and slaves. These were major changes in the social structure and the social order. Finally, the opposition to superstition and magic. Uh, we see this evidence of this going on in the book of Acts. You got Paul's encounters with Elymas, the magician, in uh, Acts 13, exorcism of a spirit from a slave in Philippi. We'll talk about Philippians here in a little while, uh, who served their her owners as a diviner and fortune teller, and the burning of books of magic by new believers in Ephesus. So, you know, this was another point of opposition that, that maybe we don't, we play down a little bit because superstition, these things are supposed to be not part of our modern, scientifically oriented society. Yeah, anyway, uh, just, just think about how popular the horoscope page is, and that'll, you know, it kind of denies that. So we're to stand against those things. And I think this is what Paul had in mind to some extent in this verse, in verse chapter 6, verse 12. We not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. All that's going to be included. Kind of to summarize this then, I have this great quote by, uh, from Larry Hurtado's book, Destroyer of the Gods, it says, along with other pagan critics, Celsus, back to Celsus again here, complained about Christians' refusal to honor their traditional gods. Indeed, despite all the alleged stupidities of Christians, Celsus expressed a willingness to tolerate them if only they would honor the gods and follow the polytheistic customs of everyone else, excepting, of course, Jews. By the refusal to do so, Celsus contended, Christians questioned the validity of the gods upon which the social and political order rested, and so we're guilty of impiety and, at least implicitly, of promoting sedition. And all I have to say to that is not much has changed. <laughs> Just one final thought on this, then I'll turn this over to, to Al. Uh, there's a, a scene in the uh, HBO series Band of Brothers that I particularly have always liked. Um, <coughs> It's, not, it's interesting, it's not in the book. The book is very good if you haven't read it, by the way. But uh, it's a, a scene where they're depicting the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge in December of 1944. And the conversation between two characters, a Lieutenant George Rice and the main character of the story, uh, Captain Richard Winters. And Rice tells Winters, he says, Panzer Division's about to cut the road south. Looks like you guys are going to be surrounded. And Winters answer to that is, we're paratroopers, Lieutenant. We're supposed to be surrounded. I think we could adapt that attitude and be well, well off with it as believers. Okay. Not too far off. Not as bad as last time. So we'll have to change up our uh, things here. Yeah, let me see if I can get this off of here. So if you just tap it, it goes to the next stream. Oh, okay. Ready to go? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Charlotte's going to run copies of a couple of a uh, couple of handouts. One of which happens to be uh, three images of Artemis. Um, so, but rather than spending a lot of time on it in the presentation, I'm going to leave it till the very end. If there's time, then we can discuss it, because you might you might find the images a little bit unsettling, but there's maybe some explanations behind it that we ought to, ought to consider. Uh, well, if we, you saw the picture of the seven wonders of the world, one of them, the, the Artemisium, the Temple to Artemis, uh, which was obviously a huge building. But I thought was interesting too was that. Uh, Probably the engineer part of me, 
that they actually built this on marshy ground because they had a real problem with earthquakes in that area. And they discovered early on that marshy ground was a good place to dampen out you know, the waves from earthquakes. But talking to my son-in-law, Paul, and my daughter, Linnea, who actually visited in Turkey and visited the archaeological site at Ephesus, they said, it's just a, it's just a swamp now. <laughs> uh, you know, most of the columns that are there, they found a few columns they put back up again where, the, where it used to be, but pretty much it's a swamp. Uh, but one of the things to, to point out, though, is that the, the archaeological ruins at Ephesus have been really well excavated, and they're pretty complete for a, for a city that old, especially considering the, the government in Turkey. Uh, it, bring, it brings in a lot of tourist dollars. Uh, so let's look at the Christian origins. It didn't happen. Are these the wrong hand? It's always the AV stuff, you know. I, don't, I remember that. I remember that in high school. <laughs> oh, that'll do it for you. Ah, there we go. Oh, thank you. So, Randy spent already quite a bit of time discussing about the the temple itself, and what an amazing structure it was. But the thing about looking at the at the Ephesus as a town is that it's kind of unique in the New Testament because it's like a laboratory. You can actually trace it uh, from when Paul founded the church, probably around A.D. 52, all the way up, at least in, uh, to the apostolic fathers, like Ignatius, have all corresponded with or dealt with Ephesus. So we can actually see kind of a little laboratory how the church grew from here to 109 or so A.D. and in, in actual writings. Because it's what I find fascinating is if you just look at a concordance, the word Ephesus shows up 17 times in the New Testament, but places like Philippi and Galatia show up like six times, and Colossae doesn't show up at all. Uh, so there's something, I think, it's, there's something important about Ephesus. And part of it is, in fact, it was a major, thank you, it was a major uh, cultural center. It was a major economic center. It was at the end of the Silk Road. Uh, so everybody had to go through and transship things to get it across to Greece and to, and to Rome. Uh, it was a very wealthy area, but also, you know, if it's got 100, 200,000 people, it's got more than just one temple. Uh, and so people had many to choose from. But this was, uh, what's interesting is at the time, although it was already happening in Paul's day, if you look at Ephesus now, it's about three miles from the, from the Aegean Sea. Uh, at the time, though, it was, a, it was an actual deep water port although it was starting to silt up when Paul was there. Uh, the Caesta River, apparently, over time, has just got added silt, added silt, and now the motion is way out there, uh, a long ways away. Uh, and this is kind of a reconstruction. That, that, by the way, this is a fascinating website, if you're interested. Uh, it's called virtualreconstruction.com. Virtualreconstruction.com. I think it's an individual in Spain. He's actually done Ephesus and some other old ancient cities, too, and try to figure out what did it look like in its prime. You know, we look at it now, you get a pile of rubble, some columns, and you get some blocks, and you get kind of a, you think it was an amphitheater, but to actually see what it might have looked like standing at the harbor, looking up the, the, the main road, all the way up to where you can see where the amphitheater there is in the background, uh, the main theater. So, and it was a very, that, and during that time, a very metropolitan area. Um, so let's see here. So I'm going to go through just, just uh, my, my plan here is to go through each reference in the New Testament to Ephesus. And the idea is to glean what we can from those and try to put together a picture of what it was that Paul was facing, the early, actually the early church, the early Christians were facing in Ephesus from what we can pick up from the writings that existed at the time, uh, at least the ones that are in Scripture, plus Ignatius. Uh, so we're going to look at, first off, we're just going to look at the, uh, Whoops. Let's give a page here. This is a this is a handout that you have. That kind of gives the timeline and also the references we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. I thought I had in here, but okay. So the first thing we're going to look at here, we're going to come back to this as time goes on. 
This one, Paul's first missionary journey. I'll throw it in here because he didn't go to Ephesus. <laughs> you know, uh, he just went to Galatia, we know, uh, made a circle trip and came back again. Probably getting stoned and killed that Lystra was probably, you know, put a damper in his travels at the time. But he, but he came back to Antioch. Uh, when we come to the second journey, which is almost on the heels of that first one, uh, Paul and Silas go back now and they go to strengthen those churches in Galatia that were founded on his first journey. And Timothy joins the team this time at Lystra. And as they go around the Mediterranean here, they actually spend time in Corinth. So they actually make the trip across. You remember the famous call to, from, to the Macedonia when Paul was here at Troas. He had asked, wanted to go this way because he knew the, the importance of Ephesus, I'm convinced, but he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit, remember, to actually go that direction. So he ends up going up through down Macedonia, down to Greece, and eventually he ends up in Corinth for 18 months. And so he spends that time there in the synagogue and then teaching. And then he makes a kind of a, a return back to Ephesus, and he just touches down, because when he's in Corinth, he meets this interesting couple, Priscilla and Aquila. And they'd been kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius in 49 when he got rid of all the followers, all the Jews, but were followers of Crestus in particular, uh, but sent them in, out, of, out of Rome. Uh, so remember that he wanted to, uh, we just have a, in Acts 16, 6, you know, he really wanted to visit on, the, on his outbound trip, but on the way back he actually had a short visit in Ephesus, where it says that he, was, he encouraged, he preached and encouraged, and they wanted him to stay longer, but he said, no, I've got business south, I've got to get back. Uh, so he established Priscilla and Aquila there as kind of the, uh, uh, the teachers, the, the leaders of the church at that point. And so then he moves on then uh, back to Antioch and Jerusalem. So then we come to the third missionary journey, so he revisits those Galatian churches again, but this time he ends up going directly to Ephesus, not forbidden this time, and he ultimately spends about three years there. He starts out spending three months or so uh, dealing with uh, or, or preaching in the synagogue in Ephesus, and then he spends the rest of that three-year period in the halls of Tyrannus. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit more time with that as we go along, but... At this time also, he ran into some disciples who uh, were disciples of John, just like this fellow we're going to meet named Apollos. Uh, now, the, there were individuals at that time who understood John the Baptist and understood about the baptism of John the Baptist and didn't know much about Jesus, if anything at all. But they still felt it necessary to go out and to preach, to draw people to repentance. Because what John was preaching was anathema to the Jews. Jews didn't need to be baptized. I mean, they were born into the chosen, the chosen race. So to actually go tell Jews you need to be baptized was pretty serious. Uh, you put your life in the line. But these people like Apollos from Alexandria were doing, those, that, were doing that as well as these other seven individuals that came that Paul met in Ephesus. So then we all know when Paul ended up going to Rome, uh, shipwrecked, well, he's under house arrest, in Rome was when the prison epistles are written, hence their name, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, about 60 to 62 AD. Uh, and the letters were carried back to it by this fellow named Tychicus that we're going to see in Ephesians and Colossians showing up, uh, and, and Philemon. And maybe some people speculate that Paul was released from house arrest for a time. Maybe he went to Spain like he really wanted to when he mentioned, when he wrote to the Romans. But, and probably during that time, he wrote the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. Now, First and Second Timothy are pretty important because Timothy was left in Ephesus. So we're going to look a little bit about what he was facing. And then, of course, Paul was executed by, by Nero. Uh, so let's now delve, dive in a little bit more into the, some of the scripture passages themselves. So in Acts 18, we saw that I mentioned that Aquila and Priscilla had been driven out of Rome. And they meet Paul at Corinth, and of course they're leather workers, they're tent makers, whatever the term might be, uh, together. So they strike up an acquaintance uh, and they actually develop a close relationship and they end up traveling with Paul to Ephesus. 
and he, he makes a short stay there, as I mentioned, and then he leaves to go back to uh, Antioch, but he leaves them there to lead the church with the beginning of the church in Ephesus. And this individual, Apollos, was a, a skilled orator who came from Alexandria, uh, once again, who knew about the, the baptism of John the Baptist, but he didn't know anything about Jesus. So they schooled him on the gospel. And he was, this is an important position because a skilled orator was like a movie star would be today, or used to be maybe. Uh, people really respected individuals who could hold, captivate an audience uh, through speaking, public speaking. And what's interesting is that soon after this, then uh, Apollos ends up traveling to Corinth, which is uh, where we come to this next slide, which was good and maybe it wasn't quite so good too. It's kind of, kind of a mixed bag. Paul comes back to Ephesus on his, on his third trip, as I mentioned, and he's already discovered there's troubles in Corinth. And those troubles, a lot of it dealt with the fact that uh, uh, there was dissension, there were factions. And some were of Apollos, some were of Paul, some were even of Jesus, but there was this conflict going on. And so the picture I have in my mind, you may agree or not, is that uh, Apollos was, was a skilled man. He had just the rudimentary understanding of Christianity. He was sent off to a very difficult place to minister, and I don't think that he was strong enough to actually hold the church together, and he ended up, there ended up being divisions that developed, and he didn't know how to stop it. So Paul kind of takes him under his wing uh, via writing to, to the Corinthians. We have two of his letters. There's probably more that were written. He probably even went with uh, went to Corinth at one point or two to, to check, with on, check in on Apollos and, uh, and make sure that he was actually learning what he needs to learn uh, about being a, a mature leader. But during this whole time, Paul was quite active in, in Ephesus and in Corinth and also in the surrounding area, uh, all the little towns that surround Ephesus, and there are quite a few. Not, some of them not so small either. Uh, so that's, what, that's where 1st and 2nd Corinthians fit in here. It was actually... Uh, written from the uh, from Ephesus. So now we come to the Paul's actual work in Ephesus. The, that three years that he spent there. This is another one of those pictures from uh, that reconstruction, virtual reconstruction, to see what it might have looked like uh, with, with all the colors and everything else that went on. It would have been a pretty impressive building. It's pretty impressive now just as a ruin. Uh, but to actually see it in color would have been really something. So he teaches for about three years, starts out with the Jews, ends up getting booted out of the synagogue, as often happens, ends up teaching in the hall, call it the School of Tyrannus, the Hall of Tyrannus. Uh, now, one of the ruins, one of the amazing ruins that you'll see, and I think this re virtual reconstruction has some pictures of it, are what's called the slope houses. On the, on the one side of Ephesus, heading out towards the east, there are these amazing houses that are kind of built into the hillside. And what they've even discovered and what they've reconstructed from what's there, this is where the rich people lived. Uh, and there weren't that many rich people, but there were some rich people. And these houses are amazing. Uh, just the, uh, the, the mosaics and the artwork that's in there that's even been there after, you know, 2,000 years. Uh, and and Tyrannus was probably an individual who lived in that community, because there's a couple of inscriptions that they found, archaeologists have found, that actually indicates him as being on a list of benefactors. You know, they didn't have a lot of government funding for public buildings. They relied on rich people, uh, philanthropists, as it were, to actually supply things like theaters, uh, you know, and, other, and stadiums and things like that. <clears throat> so he's mentioned, actually, uh, the same name, which is an unusual name, as a city benefactor. But as uh, Randy mentioned, his ministry ended rather abruptly, Paul's did, uh, due to uh, uh, a little bit of a revolt by a guy named Demetrius and the silversmiths who made little votive statues, uh, which isn't one of these, but little votive statues of Diana. And then later on, we're going to see we get to when the Apostle John settles there, they actually made little votive statues of Mary. They look an awful lot alike because uh, Mary actually followed John to, uh, to Ephesus. Because remember, at the, at the cross, it was Jesus who said that, you know, 
you're, you're now his mother, you know, and you, you take care of each other. So John was given the responsibility to take care of Mary. So they actually, the, the, there's actually a ruin of a little house that they said is the house of Mary uh, in Ephesus. Yes? Is this a picture of the three things they built? They no, that's, that's an actual statue in the, from the temple. <coughs> They got stolen and put in Europe. Um, but we also saw in Acts, in Acts 19 as well, while he's in Ephesus, uh, the sons of Sceva that, uh, that Randy was alluding to. It says that they spent, I should get the exact quote, the thousands of, of uh, dollars in magic books that the people actually burned <laughs> Uh, as a result of Paul's ministry there, which of course caused even more trouble uh, with the with the locals, but uh, let me find it here. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found that they came to fifty thousand pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That gives us a picture, like Randy was mentioning, of how pervasive magic was, and sorcery was, and divination was in Ephesus. It was a, it was a part of their culture. So we're going to see that it crops up in some of the, the writings. You know, what are the churches going to do? What are the Christians going to do in this situation? Um, so, moving along here. The next time in the, New, in the New Testament we run across Ephesus is when Paul returns... Uh, from his, from his trip, and, he, and the, uh, he makes a, I should go back to that slide. Anyway, he makes a farewell address in Acts chapter 20 to the elders at the church in Ephesus. But he has them meet him in the town of Miletus, which is just down the coastline a few miles from Ephesus, a large city on its own. But the evidence is that the, the harbor was already silting up, and the big ships, the big boats, couldn't get into Ephesus anymore. But Miletus still had a deep water harbor. Not much longer, but they had it at that point. So if Paul was, was riding or tra traveling on, you know, they didn't have cruise ships. They didn't have passenger liners. You rode on a trade ship. So if he got on a large trade ship in Troas and uh, Assos and came down the coast, the ship probably put in at Miletus because he couldn't get into Ephesus. Only smaller ships could at that point. So he, called, he sends word to the elders and, the, uh, and they come down. And it's kind of interesting because uh, yeah, Paul's in the process of, he has a delegation of people with him of individuals from churches in Macedonia and other places that are taking an offering to the church in Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of a show of affection and also a sign of respect where the church originated in Jerusalem. But he tells them of how much, how hard he worked in actually going house to house as well as teaching publicly when he was in Ephesus. Uh, and, and he warns them. He warns them about wolves coming in after him to devour the church. So that's an important data point because that's going to keep cropping up in the history of Ephesus. And he also tells them the fact that, you know, remember, I, I supported myself while I was there. Uh, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to set an example by showing somebody that was uh, in love with money, which is kind of an indication of maybe how they felt about remuneration to people who were leaders. You know, he didn't want... He didn't want to be seen as a money grubber. Uh, so he kept, he kept his own profession. And now it comes the letter of Ephesians, which we're going through now. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to be going through this anyway, except to point out a couple things that people have, have had issues with about Ephesians. And their recent issues, they were pretty good for about 1,900 years, and all of a sudden, uh, now people have issues. Uh, <coughs> And one of the issues is that uh, Paul didn't write it. Uh, they, love to they do love to say that. That's, that's, that's the first thing you can mention you know, with any of the new school people or others like that is Paul didn't write it. One of his disciples wrote it. But what's interesting is the early church leaders, the early church fathers, all recognized that Paul was the writer. And of course, they're ignorant and savages. They didn't know, and they just just because they lived there at the time and actually responded and knew Paul and knew his handwriting <laughs> doesn't make any difference. Uh, we're much smarter than they are. Uh, and the other part of this too is that uh, a lot of people believe, well, he didn't really write it to Ephesus. Uh, 
Now, and the reason why they've done that is because there's an, the earliest actual manuscript by date is one that's called the Chester Beatty Papyrus, and it doesn't have Ephesus in the salutation to this letter. Now, it's the, it's the oldest, it's the closest to the apostolic times, but it's not the only one that exists back then. And what's interesting is that people will, will glom on to the, you know, the P46 and say that this is, it's not there, so it can't be there. And they, later on, somebody added it. Uh, but I, I, I'm looking at a commentary, which is beyond, technically beyond my ability, by a guy named uh, Stephen Baugh, who points out that in the Greek, the construction doesn't allow that. Somebody just forgot to put it in or omitted it. Uh, because the way the construction of the Greek language is, uh, it doesn't read right without Ephesus in there. If you take the word Ephesus out, it doesn't read right. Uh, so uh, he points out, and I think, I think he's pretty persuasive, that uh, it wasn't just a circular letter where somebody sent it out with a blank and you fill in your local church at the top. Uh, people recognized, other church fathers recognized, this is a letter written from, or written to Ephesus. Matter of fact, this fellow Ignatius we're going to look at admits or states that as well. Um, but the key part is that the, you know from here is that Paul is warns them that you know don't depart from my teachings. Remember, he, he's the one that told them there's wolves coming in after me. Uh, so you want to make sure that you stick to what I've taught you because remember these people, like Randy was talking about, they're in a tough situation. This is a really difficult. I'm surprised the church survived. Uh, when you think about it, it had to be the Holy Spirit at work. They, they had no New Testament. They had some letters, some of which were spurious, some of which were valid, floating around. Communication was poor and slow. How do you decide what's true from what's false? Uh, by God's grace, you know, the church made it. It's a great, one of the best examples of God's grace I know. But it was a difficult time. And so sometimes we read back into this that, how come, they don't, how come they didn't know any better? Well, because they didn't have anything any better uh, in a lot of cases. So he also t- tells them, don't get drawn back to magic. You know, you left that, don't go back to it. Although I'm sure it's very tempting. Uh, and then we come to the, the continuing ministry that Paul had through Timothy. The letters that he wrote to Timothy tell him to stay in Ephesus. Uh, I got work for you there. And it's interesting because the tone in First and Second Timothy is different than Ephesians. Some people look at Ephesians and say, "Oh, there's nothing really good. There's nothing really interesting in here. There's no, there's no controversies. There's no uh, telling people that they're fools and things like that." Uh, I think they missed the point of the book. But when you get to First and Timothy, that, you know that that stops. He names names, which a lot of Paul's later letters did. Uh, he he names people he calls agents of Satan, which I listed here. Um, so he, it's no longer, you know, here are the principles that you need to follow, you need to inculcate into your life. Now it's, you can be led, about, led astray by some people, and here they are. Here's the ones. Uh, and, and the nature of, the, of those uh, false teachings that hadn't stopped yet, the Judaizers are still around, or their heirs. Uh, the whole concept of having to have special knowledge and you've know, got to be on the inside to get the special knowledge. Some people think that Gnosticism didn't show up until the second century. It's already here, uh, I think, in its early forms. There were also the mystery religions, which were quite popular, especially with the Roman military. But these, there, were, there were initiation rites that involved blood and things like that that looked an awful lot like some of the early church uh, meetings. But uh, the whole concept, though, behind pagan worship, including the mystery religions, is exchange which is wholly different from Christianity. It was, I will do this for you, Artemis, if you will do this for me. So I will offer you, uh, I got this great bull I'll offer you as a sacrifice, and we're going to pray too, and you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go without something for Lent, and in, and in, and in, in favor for, in, or return for that, I'd like to, be, I'd like to prosper in my business and have a healthy family. Always in pagan worship, it's an it's exchange. Always an exchange, which God doesn't do. What are we going to exchange? We got nothing. We got nothing to bring to the table. Um, and the other thing I mentioned here is, is syncretism, that Randy alluded to too. Is, is try to 
the whole idea that the empire had, and they developed great skill at doing this and trying to blend different religions, different aspects of different religions into some kind of a homogeneous mixture so that you wouldn't offend anybody. But if you don't think we're not New Testament times. Um, then we come to the, the ministry of John, the Apostle John in Ephesus. Uh, so this is where now we're getting a little bit later. Now we're into the, into the 80s and 90s A.D., so we're after Paul. Paul was dead, dead in 64, maybe 68. But now we're getting into the 80s and 90s. Uh, and after, sometime after Paul's death, nobody really knows how and when, he moved to Ephesus. And, I, and it, the tradition is that he brought Mary with him. And he says that there's many false prophets, and he uses this new term, Antichrist, that are in the area. And he's writing from Ephesus. He's the leader of Ephesus uh, Church. <coughs> So I've got some quotes here from 1 John 2, 19 and 20. Uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. So there's some stuff going on inside the church. People are leaving. People are, are spreading uh, false teachings. And one of those false teachings he shows in about three verses later, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. So this is kind of lumped under this uh, uh, term docetism, uh, where there's this understanding that of nature that comes from the Greeks that there's a, there's a dualism. Spirit is good, material is evil. And so Jesus came in physical form. Obviously, he can't be deity, because that's evil. He can't be something physical. He has to be something spiritual. So obviously what you see there isn't really human. It's just a spirit in some kind of a covering, hence the term docetism. So that was apparently a quite common belief during that time which had to be deal dealt with. And the church, as we're going to see later on, later on, actually did a pretty good job of dealing with this. Let me come to those books that we fly over, Second John, uh, you know, which is addressed to the chosen lady, which probably is a euphemism for a church, a local church. Uh, and messengers had come from this local church to John in Ephesus uh, asking about what are we going to do with these false teachers we've got? We think they're false teachers. And he says in verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Sound familiar? Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist again. So here we've got the same problem keeps cropping up here in that people are denying that it's Jesus Christ who actually came in the flesh. Uh, he was a spirit being with maybe an outer covering, but he obviously was not human and God at the same time. Um, and he says, don't let anybody like that teach in your church. You know, guard your pulpit. Uh, and then we come to 3 John, which now is addressed not to a church, but to an individual named Gaius. Uh, and he's telling them to you know, keep being hospitable to the messengers who I, who I send out into the countryside around Ephesus. Because, you know, they, there was no Motel 6. Uh, you had to stay with somebody. And so he said, you know, stay with telling guys, keep being hospitable to the, right, to the people that I send out. Uh, but he says, be careful with the ones that I don't send out. And one of those is your local leader, Diotrephes. Uh, be careful with him. You need to step up and you need to challenge his teaching. He's not teaching the truth. Uh, and if you can't do it, kind of implies that you get somebody who can. Uh, you, need to you need to take a stand against this false teacher. Uh, but it's kind of interesting. It's just kind of the same pattern like Paul. You know, John's earlier letters are written in much more general. When you get down to the, his later letters, he names names. Uh, you know, it's getting right down to, this is brass tacks. Okay, the last section that uh, mention of Ephesus in the Bible is in the book of Revelation. It's the very first of the seven letters, uh, or the seven prophetic utterances, more likely, to the churches, in, all in Asia Minor. And the first one is a letter to Ephesus. And it's in uh, the first seven verses of chapter 2. And it points out that there's a continuing struggle with false teachers. But, and he says that you guys started out battling false teachers, and you didn't tolerate evil men. You didn't tolerate evil leaders. Paul told them to be on guard against false teachers, and, he's, and they're commended for being on guard. Uh, he, and he says the... The conflict with the heresies, he recognizes, this is Jesus, it was work, it was toil, and it was perseverance 
But he says, you haven't grown weary. You're, keep, you're still at it. You're still fighting off the enemy in all the different forms that he takes. And you detest the ne deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nobody knows exactly what, who they are. Well, it's speculation. But if you look also at the, church, the letter to the church at Pergamon, too, uh, it's probably a case of trying to come up with a way of compromising with the culture around you. And there's a reference to Balaam. Remember how he was not allowed by God to curse Israel, but he pulled Barak, you know, the, the lock, Barak aside and said, here's how you get them. <laughs> Send your good-looking girls in there and seduce all the young men, and, and, and they'll quit serving God. And the same picture is given here of using uh, sex to undermine leadership. And, of course, that's nothing really new either. The tragedy that happened with uh, Robbie Zacharias and others, you know, it's just uh, how, the, how this still keeps getting used. Um, but once again, they had, they had refused to compromise with, the, uh, with pagan idolatry. But he says, you've lost your first love. That's his only criticism of them. And some people think, well, they, they, you know, they lost their enthusiasm. Uh, I don't think that's really the point. I think what it's really talking about is the fact that they were no longer expressing their at one time zealous love for the Lord by witnessing to him in the world. They developed kind of a fortress mentality. They're so busy fighting off the enemy. They've kind of developed this fortress mentality and they're not out witnessing in the community. You've lost your first love. Uh, so it was no longer now the center for ministry like it was with the Apostle Paul. Uh, and he tells them to let, let Jesus relight your lampstand. You know, you need to be light in the world, uh, and you're not. And one final individual. This is a fascinating individual. He's one of the early church leaders. He's the disciple of the apostle John. His name is Ignatius. He was the bishop, the leader of the church in Antioch in Syria, you know, Paul's old headquarters. Um, he was arrested for his faith. He was taken to Rome and eventually executed. But on his way... He stopped in Smyrna, town north of Ephesus, and he wrote some letters. And one of those letters is actually to Ephesus. And he's writing as a, as a bishop, as a, a pastor of pastors. Uh, and he mentions that you're still struggling with false teachers. Give me that larger book down there. You're still struggling with false teachers and persecution. Uh, not just local, though the big book. Um, it tells him to, to imitate Christ. You know, be patient when slandered. Uh, respond in prayer, show gentleness even though they're being cruel to you. Uh, he says, the spirit of deceit preaches itself and speaks his own things, for he seeks to please himself. He glorifies himself, for he's full of ar arrogance. He is lying, fraudulent, soothing, flattering, treacherous, rhapsodical, trifling, inharmonious, verbose, sordid, and timorous. That sounds like Paul's list expanded. Mm -hmm. So apparently some of the same false teachers were hanging around <laughs> by about A.D. 100 that Paul had been dealing with before. And he says, you need to avoid these as you would wild beasts. So some of these issues were still there. He compliments them on, in most of it, because uh, he says you really haven't given any heed to false teachers, but you've got to be on guard. Um, and he, has, he says here that, uh, Blessed then are you who are God-bearers, Spirit bearers, temple bearers, bearers of holiness, adorned in all respects with the commandments of Jesus Christ, being a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Where do you get that from? First Peter. First Peter. Uh, on whose account I rejoice exceedingly, because Peter also ministered in this area, and have had the privilege by this epistle of conversing with, conversing with the saints which are at Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Or that, what's that? That's Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. And he says, gosh, it was addressed to Ephesus. Anyway, <coughs> rest my case. I'm not a scholar. Um, but, he links, but he likens heresy to drinking poison mixed with sweet wine, uh, which is how dangerous it is. Uh, and so he mentions, you know, that uh, it's the same false teachers. The Judaizers are still around now. It's called the Ebionite heresy, but you know, that you need to still maintain Jewish practices if you're going to be a Christian. Um, and docetism is still a big issue. 
So just to tie all this together, uh, the Ephesians were commended in, in Revelation for good doctrine, for resistance to false teachers, and they had many of them. They didn't compromise with pagan practices, um, like the trade guilds. Uh, they're resistant to dualism, to Greek philosophies, uh, and syncretism, they're trying to convert homogenized religions, and they persevered. But those, all these emphases that you're doing, these things that you're protecting the gospel, you're protecting your people, are severely reducing your impact on your neighbors. So I think a lesson there for us too. Maybe they're just being seen as killjoys in the neighborhood because they're always on defense uh, and developing a fortress mentality. So he's telling them, you know, be, be more proactive, not just so reactive in sharing the gospel with the individuals around you. So that looks at all the references that I could find to Ephesus. Uh, but I think it's fascinating is that we actually have the story of Ephesus from its founding all the way out to after the... With, you know, the first level of fathers after the apostles are all gone. Uh, you know, the disciples of the, of the first apostles. So, anybody have any questions? Do you want to stick around long enough to talk about those pictures? <laughs> One thing you want to notice about the, the pictures is, first off, the, those uh, protuberances on her midriff are part of her clothes, they're not part of her. You can tell from the color contrast on the one over here. So it's, it's part of her clothing, that's one thing, it's not her. Uh, and the question's always been, well, what are they? <laughs> and this is where some people get confused and say, obviously, they're, they're breasts, so it's a fertility goddess. Or some people say that they're testicles. Let me say, well, there are eggs. I think that's the closest. But what I think is really important is maybe to understand is that I think that they are bee eggs. If you look at how a hive actually where our bee eggs are kept, this looks very similar. And there's a couple of reasons why I think that's true. Uh, one of them is that bees were considered animals that reprodu reproduced asexually. And remember, she's an Amazon <laughs> derivative. She was fierce on defending chastity. Uh, you know, she, there were stories of her. One of the famous ones is uh, a. Uh, uh, it's in the it's in the mythology. She was being pursued by a man, uh, and at one point he was out hunting with his dogs, and she was out with her maidens taking a bath, and he saw her without any clothes on, and she got so upset that she turned him into a stag, and his dogs ate him. <laughs> That is not a fertility, that's not a fertility goddess. <laughs> uh, and she was also considered the, you can see here with the animal, the protector of wild animals. Uh, and she's also, also shown often with a, with a bow and arrow because she was the, the, uh, the goddess of childbirth. Childbirth was the number one killer of women during that time. I mean, warfare killed off the men, number one, but child care, childbirth was the killer of most women. Uh, the, excuse me, the number one killer of women. Uh, and so the, the picture is she's the one that you made offerings to to have a, a good childbirth. And also, she was also said that if you were, all, you were also to pray that if you got into a lot of pain and this was not going well and you weren't going to make it, that she would shoot you with her arrows and take you out of your misery. So the hunting part fits in as well. Huh? Oh, I see the, the, the picture here is actually if you look at it closely, it's a city wall with a, with a tower. She, she was the protector of Ephesus. And her temple was way off to the east. It's not downtown. It was way off to the east on the other side of the hill. So she was out there as the protector, uh, as well as also called, they also called her the savior. But, uh, but if you read commentaries, Norman and I have been going back and forth about this too. If you, if you look at commentaries, a lot of people will say, it's just another fertility cult. Now, this is a little different situation, uh, I think. And the other fascinating thing is that the symbol that they, that they found on coins that were minted in Ephesus, the city symbol, is a bee. <laughs> they say, okay, case closed as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, um, anybody have any questions? Other than the fact you want to get out here and stand up or something. Other than that.
so much emphasis, like you pointed out, mm -hmm. as the city of uh, the city of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, the mere fact that it's included in Revelation in the seven uh -huh. churches, and Paul, you know, I mean, um, Paul seemed like he had this real obsession with getting out there and spreading the gospel and go, 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 establishing churches, mm -hmm. go, go, go. And yet he takes three years yeah. of his ministry in Ephesus. You know, he really sees the importance of establishing this town, you know, this church in this town. So I've always been, been struck by that, with the fact that, boy, in the Lord's, you know, big perspective on things, Ephesus really must have had a special importance. I think it did because he spent three years teaching there. What was he doing? Yeah. Well, he was teaching disciples, yeah. and he was sending them out. Yeah. I mean, on all the towns in Asia Minor, the seven, the seven churches that are mentioned, yeah. Colossae, these are all basically daughter churches from Ephesus. Church plants. They're all church plants. Yeah. Some, of them, some of them he planted, you know, it would have been over the mountain range over to where Galatia was. So all those churches that are out in that area uh, to the north and to the west of Ephesus were probably all started by disciples of Paul after he taught them in Ephesus. So I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, it's a strategic center. It's on the, it's on the main trade routes, all the ships tie in there. Uh, yeah, so it'd be the place to train disciples. Yeah, my, uh, this is one of these discoveries in life that when I discovered it, it just kind of had an overwhelming effect on me because when, most of you know that I lived in Italy as a kid, and my dad did a lot of traveling. He was a civil engineer mm -hmm. like you all. You know, and uh, and he he had to do a lot of his work, you know, throughout the Mediterranean, down into Africa, and he'd go on these extended trips. And uh, um, <coughs> after my mom died, I, I, I my dad had all, the, had all these uh, um, um, flights, okay. five millimeter mm -hmm. flights, okay. and and I wanted to organize them and, and put them together in a book and blah 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 and so forth. And I was going through the slides, and all of a sudden, I realized my dad was in Ephesus. <laughs> and and it's really neat, you know, the the, uh, the marble road. Uh -huh. I think it's a remnant of that of the road Randy talked about, yep. or at least the Royal Highway. Yeah, yeah. Royal Highway. Yeah. It was made of marble. Yeah. You know, he has this picture of this, you know, <laughs> section of this highway that's probably oh, it's at least a quarter of a mile longer, yep. longer. That was all marble slabs, you know, yep. paved with marble slabs, and one of the pictures he had was the theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, you know, it was one of those moments in time like, oh, my dad got to go to Ephesus. You yeah. know, experience, you know, and, and uh, anyway. If you're interested too, I've, I've, I found a book that actually is full of photographs of Ephesus and, and the other churches in that area, mm -hmm. Miletus and some of the others. And uh, it's amazing how the Lord preserved all those ruins. Yeah. Some of them are better preserved even than Ephesus, the ones that are in the yeah. book there. Yeah. And some are totally un unexcavated, like Colossae has never been excavated. So there's a, a <coughs> they were. We think they're idiots. You think what they did was like they did it without calculations of computers or well, heavy or dark machinery or you know the <coughs> things we have today, and yet they built things. They we still can't figure out how they built. It. Nobody can figure. Out, yeah, nobody can figure out how they got the roof sections on the Artemis Temple. Right. Yeah. They weigh about sixty-five tons. Dredging. Harbor, yeah. You know? Can you imagine well, doing that without big ships or big <laughs> well, the, the other thing is, you know, you know, you, again, you're civil engineers and so forth, and city, you know, planners and so forth are, you know, to have, you know, a couple hundred thousand or five hundred thousand people living in an area, and it's like, how do you take care of that many people in that concentrated area? Yeah. You know, water, sanitation, uh, yep. you know, and so forth. I mean, in Europe in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Didn't do a very good job of it. Yeah. And, and yeah. I yeah. think they had a sewer system. I read they had. Yeah. Oh yeah. System. Yeah, they did. But I mean, they had bathrooms. They had some of the first bathrooms. Yeah. Yeah, and, they, and, they, and there were public baths. Public baths and yeah. the whole bit. Yeah. 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 Heated public baths. But there were all these heated. Yeah. yeah. All these primitive people, you know, that didn't yeah. know anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I used to live 
Yeah. So, you know, you didn't drink water, I don't think, when you were you know? Still do it in China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, these, these, these people took care of that. And, I mean, some of the people, some of these towns, you'll see in the, if you look at this book, a couple of the towns are still using the Roman aqueducts. They put a pipe in on top of it, but they're still using the structure of the Roman aqueduct. They're still using Roman bridges. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, in Korea too. Yeah. Human disposal is bread. You use bread. Yeah. No. Mexico too. Yeah. Yeah. Spread of the gospel, and that was one of the one of the complaints that Demetrius made. Yeah. And you note this that this business we have our wealth, and you see that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia. This Paul has persuaded and turned a great many of people. So yeah. he, that was an effective three years. He went beyond, well beyond Ephesus. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, you know, that Luke mentions, you know, that Paul says that he reached all of Asia. Mm-hmm. Well, it had to do it through he had to do it through his disciples. He didn't do it personally. But and it's also interesting is you know that the, the Jews got all upset with the Christians for religious reasons. The Gentiles got upset for Christians because it, they ruined commerce. <laughs> they hurt business. <laughs> uh, and that's obviously the case with Demetrius. So. Any other questions? Or? Okay. Have a great evening. What's left of it, huh?